So what I'm going to do now, and then we can, we can probably break after this um, for a few minutes before lunch, um, is talk, a, talk about a, an example that I have that will illustrate and bring a lot of these ideas into, um, uh, uh, basically help to, to illustrate a lot of these principles with a concrete example. And so I don't like to use um, <clears throat> software or hardware because there is a diverse audience. And so I, I'm just going to use the process of how I actually wrote the book that I mentioned, about, that I mentioned before. Um, and so this very much follows the same process over here, and I'll kind of outline through that. And so even though um, many of you may not have written a book before, you can still appreciate the steps of writing a book. It's not, it's, it's not an easy undertaking. It's something that can take you know, months and sometimes even years for some people to actually write a book, to find the time to do it. So it's, it's a lot of work, and it's, it's, it's almost like building a product, as we'll see. And I apply the same process to do that. So I'll kind of recount that story. So going back. Uh, two years, I mentioned how I ran into the works of uh, Steve Blank and, and Eric Ries. And I decided I was going to apply those principles to my next product because I've been building products all these different ways. These, these principles resonated with me at a theoretical level, and I wanted to take them down to practice. And so for a few months, I just tried to uh, literally apply what was in the Four Steps to Epiphany and what Eric was saying. And I quickly realized that a, there were a lot of gaps. There were a lot of things that they were talking about that were hard to apply. So in the case of Steve Blank's book, uh, most of it was written with an enterprise software context. So a lot of the techniques um, that are in the middle of the book were, were completely useless. I mean, they're not completely useless, but they were not very applicable to what I, was, what I was doing. So I had more questions about how do I really do these kinds of things? How do I, how do I really get these interviews? You know, do I pay them? Do I not pay them? You know, what, what are some of the things that kind of go with that? So I had all these questions there. Looking at Eric Ries, he was writing a lot about the Lean Startup but he was writing more retro, retrospectively, looking at a company which was no longer, IMV was no longer a startup. While, while it started out as a three, four person kind of endeavor, it turned out to be, at, at that time, was a 50 person company making 40, 50 million dollars in revenue a year. And so when you looked at them, they were really a lean startup machine. They were pushing software releases 50 times a day. Um, they had these very complicated systems in place, um, metrics, all these kinds of things. And so it was very daunting and very scary to actually look at that and say, you know, do I start building those systems now? Like, what do I really do? And so I decided that rather than, you know, than, than doing nothing, I was going to start this blog. <coughs> and I was just going to outline my own experiences of, of applying this process. So every week, I took, these, um, I took these ideas and I started building. You know, I did interviews and shared that learning and just started the process there. And I actually probably was fortunate because it was a good timing. Because at that time, um, Eric Reese and Steve Blank were also evangelizing a lot of these concepts early on. And the question they would often get is, well, we know it worked for you and you, but who else is, who else is doing this? Who else is interested in lean startups? And can you show any other person applying this? And so they would often point to my blog and a handful of other blogs. So that helped to drive some early traffic, early traction. And build, I was able to build a readership pretty fast, even just with that weekly learning. Um, and along the way, I, I started to get requests from a handful of people to, to write a book. And at first, I kind, of, I, I kind of laughed that off and said, I'm flattered, but you know, I'm too busy running my own startup. A book is something you do. You basically go into the mountains for, for a year, and, and you write this book. I don't have time for that, so I'm not writing, I'm not writing any book. And so I turned them, kind of turned them away. But after about the, the 12th request, I decided to take it you know, seriously and at least see if there was something here. And that is that first stage of understanding the problem. So I set up phone calls with all, all, people, all the people who had requested that I write a book. And I actually tried to talk them out of it and said, you know, there's, there's this blog. But more importantly, there's all this content. You know, there's all this online content. Eric has content. Steve Blank has a book. Um, other people are writing books. You know, what is my book really going to add to that conversation? And why should I write it? And so they helped me articulate what became the value proposition eventually. And that was, again, that whole notion of the practice trumps theory uh, concept is that, like me, many of them were um, earlier stage startups or even just, start, or even just companies that were interested in lean startups but were running into the same obstacles of how do we take a lot of these theoretical principles or ideas and really distill them down into actionable uh, practices and, and techniques that actually can, can work and can raise, can, 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 uh, can raise their chances of working. And so they were looking at my blog as a, as a way that was kind of very transparently outlining those things. And they felt, and of course, everyone downplays the complexity of building products. And many of them said, if, if all you did was just take your blog posts, you know, did a little bit of cut and paste job, and, and, and slap them into a book, you would have a book, and they would pay for it. And so I was like, OK, that's you know, probably not achievable. But you know, it, it, there's, there's some value in that, because I've been writing all this stuff. So it would be easier to write this book. 
So I said, fine. I, so at that point, I had 12 people. So that's the qualitative validation. I had 12 people who said they were interested in writing this book. But I didn't go off and try to write the book. The next thing I had to do was build my demo or that proxy of a solution. So I built a teaser page, which at the time looked something like this. And it's, it's dark. You may not be able to see it clearly. But it was not very pretty. It didn't even have a, a book cover, because I knew that the book cover was not going to sell a book. You know, the, the, it's, it's not the book cover that sells the book. It's what's in it. So I just picked a stock graphic. At the time, I didn't have an old enough um, version of this. But I, the title that I had picked was Getting Lean versus Running Lean. And a lot of people felt that was too passive. They felt that it needed to be more active. And so I turned it to Running Lean eventually. But that's an example of how I, I, I took the idea of the book. I created this landing page and called those 12 people up and said, if I wrote this book, would you buy it? Now, I was more interested, above anything up, up, up here, I was more interested in the table of contents. Because that was, that was going to be what was inside the book. And so I showed them this table of contents. And that was a great way to get the initial feedback on what should be in this book. And it helped me refine the table of contents. Uh, people, helped me, um, <clears throat> yeah, pe people helped me organize this in a, in a much more coherent manner. And then I, I didn't have price on here because this was going to be a business book price between $20 to $30. I just tested that on the phone and said, if I build this product, would you, would you pay $20 to $30? And all, of, all 12 of them said, yes. If you wrote this book with this table of contents, I would, I would buy this book. So at this point, I had that qualitative validation where I had 12 people that were willing to buy my book, but it wasn't yet a problem worth solving. Because even if I wrote this book for 12 people at $20, that was a couple hundred dollars. It was not going to cover my cost for writing this book. And so what I did then was, was, was basically put up this teaser page or I added this. Um, I put a coming this summer. This was February of, um, of 2009. And I, I was bold enough to say coming this summer. And then I put in a, an email page for people to, to kind of register their interest. And I left this up. I did a little bit of promotion. I you know, blogged about it. I tweeted it. And folks like Eric and Steve like, helped to promote uh, the fact that I was thinking of writing a book. So that also drove some traffic. But I started to collect email addresses, and then I just did nothing. I kind of left this teaser page up, and I went back to running my product. And about early summer, I had 1,000 email addresses on this teaser page. And that's when it became a problem worth solving for me. That's when it became interesting. Because at, at those numbers, I did the math. And I did think you know, a lot of it could be done with cut and paste. Uh, with, with that math, I felt like if I actually wrote this book, I would break even, and I would be producing something of value. So you know, why not? And I'd probably get more people signed up over time. So why not? Let's take this seriously. So I started writing the book. And it was not as easy as I thought. It was not really a cut and paste job. Even the first chapter was, was hard to write. And so I then built the MVP for the book. So rather than going and trying to really write a book, I actually announced a free workshop here in Austin. And actually, in the original TechCrunch, that was, those are the guys who hosted it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I would I would say I would say I was 50-50. I mean, it was an idea I was entertaining, right? And so, and that's something that I, I stress a lot about in in the whole process is that I, I'm all about experimenting, even with ideas. So, as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure many of you are the same in the room, in the, in the room, is we constantly get bombarded with ideas while you're in the shower, while you're driving. And for me, what I'm really in search of is how do I find ideas worth pursuing? How do I find problems worth solving? And this is a, this is a, a real example of how that really happened. Where it was a, so the first case was a, a, a situation of me not even looking to do something, but in the lean world we call that customer pull, where a few people said you know you should go do this thing because you're qualified to do it, and then you kind of explore and really make sure it's an idea worth pursuing, um, and that would be something that would be worth your time before you kind of get around to do it. So I would be happy to, to have taken that teaser page down if I hadn't gotten enough folks on there and said you know it was just not not going to be worth the effort or left the teaser page up long enough till where I would got enough people on there and maybe eventually got tired and, and pulled it down. Um, so yeah. But, so, but I would say with, with the free workshop, what I did there was it was very much like the workshop that I'm showing you now, but not nearly as, as, as fancy on the, on the graphics. It was really death by PowerPoint or death by bullet points. So I took the table of contents that I had, and for every one of the major chapters, just created a page. And I even have those original versions. They were black and orange. They were really ugly to look at. Um, people would get eye aches looking at them. But the idea there was to just, again, test the content out. So I put these slides up. I announced a free workshop. I didn't really have any narrative of what I was going to talk about. But I just announced that to the Lean Startup group here. And a number of people jumped, jumped at it. So 30 people jumped at it. And that's a good. 
that's a good technique to also use with your products. Is if you can give away your product for free, it's very hard to really charge for that. And so it's a good way to, to test if you're actually producing something of value. So I had 30 people interested in that. Um, and there were a number of folks from TechCrunch. They were even um, people like Jason Cohen was, was one of them who was interested to come in. And so I was able to hand select the initial 10 because I wanted to start with just 10 people. One, because we had a small room. But two, because we talk about another principle in lean startups is one of iterating in small batches. So if I had taken 30 people, and those are all the people I was able to attract, and I did one workshop and it failed miserably, then I would have no other, I would have no other way to test this idea after those initial 30. So, but by taking them in batches of 10, I, was able, I gave myself the opportunity to run at least three workshops and test the concept and iterate on the slides if I needed to. And so we did this workshop, and at the end of the workshop, the feedback I got is that it was, it was really valuable, it was super helpful, and many of them said they would have even been happy to pay for it. And so I was like, well, that's interesting, so let's actually do a paid workshop. So with, this, the, with, so with the second cohort, the second and third one, I started charging for the workshop. And it was a nominal fee, and then I started to raise those, those fees as I went on to experiment to see, again, what is the value that people would place on content like this. Um, and for me, the, the, the workshops were really, again, just a way for testing the content and really creating the, that coherent flow that I would put down in the book. And so after every workshop, I would go back and tweak the slides. I would go and reorder things so they flowed better. And I would constantly be iterating on the content, but not by way of writing pages in the book, but by tweaking with the slides, which to me was a faster way to, to iterate. And the fastest way to get the feedback was to present it to people and, and get, kind of get their feedback during and after, after the workshops. So I ran a number of these all through the summer. And about fall is where I felt like I had the flow down. And I knew what I was going to write. And I, it was very clear. And I even knew what the first chapter was going to be because I had repeated it so many times. Like the words were just flowing. I knew what to put out there. Um, and also about that time, I started getting some of the folks who had signed up starting to get antsy because summer had come and gone. And there was really still coming this summer. I hadn't even updated that. And it was no longer summer. So I changed that to coming this fall or coming this winter at that point. And I went back to them and said, yes, you know, I, as you and I thought, this is not really a cut and paste job. It's really taken much longer to, to get this book out. And it's going to take me another potentially four to six months to write it. But rather than making you wait, if you pre-order the book now, I, I'll, I'll give you a preview chapter that you can read now. But if you pre-order the book, the, the rest of the book, I'll make a deal where every two weeks I'll give you two chapters of the book. So I turned writing the book into much like you would write software. I turned it into an iterative process. And th the reason I was also able to do that is because this book is very chronological. For, for a lot of folks, they're starting with that step one. And it's going to take them several weeks to get to a point where they will need the, the other parts of the book. And you don't want to read the, it's the whole thing of right action, right time. Because if you're not really in product market fit stage, any of that stuff is not really relevant to you. So a number of people like bought into that. And about, I would say, a half of them, it was exactly close to half that actually pulled the trigger. So I went back to the landing page and I added a pre-order the PDF option. I gave a little discount because you know, it was something I at that time felt it would be fair just to, to get them. Um, probably now I wouldn't even give a discount, but that's just back then. And I had, a, and I actually I did just turn that to coming soon because I didn't have a date at that point. Um, and, uh, and I would say that I had a thousand people on there and about half of them pulled the trigger and, and pre-ordered the book and said, yes, we'll have it. Now, the other half you know, said they were still interested in the book, but they cited reasons like, well, you know, they like to read the book on Kindle, or, or they want a real physical book, or they, or they like the iPad. or you know, They had a, a lot of different reasons, or they just wait. They didn't want to have this incremental book. And that's a great um, lesson in there as well. And that's, that's how you can, you can also qualify your early adopters from people who are customers, but not be, they, they may not be your early customers. And so for me, like, for at, at this point in time, it still was not um, risky. I mean, it, was, it was not what was riskiest for me. I, I knew I could go and to Amazon and do a lot of these self-printing, self-publishing types of things and really get this in all of those formats if I wanted to. But to me, that was a, still a form of waste because I wanted to write this book first and foremost, get feedback from people. So I was going to write it on my word processor, on my Mac and just release it as a PDF. And for those that wanted that, I was happy to, to give it to them. For those that didn't, I told them, you know, I'd be happy to, to, to let you know when the final book is out. And so that's, an, again, an example of how early on we are really after attracting early adopters that can see through the book and are, would, would, would accept this book in any, in any format because they were really after the content and not so much the packaging of the product. And so that's, uh, that's what I did here. So I, I wrote this book every two weeks and did these two-week releases of the book. 
Now, something interesting happened along the way is that as I wrote about three-fourths of the book, I kind of got a random phone call from a major publisher that said, you know, we, have, we, we know you're writing this book. Not only that, we've actually, we've actually got the preview copy of the book, and we like it. We want to publish it. So it was not even a conversation of, you know, let's, let's look at the manuscript. Let's figure out what the market is. They'd already done all of that just by watching what I had done. And so I kind of, at first I was a little surprised. I said, why would you want to publish this book? Because I've been self-publishing it. It's this PDF, which is not DRM protected. Um, it's circulating like wildly. Like people are, people were like sharing it with everyone because even though I told them not to, that inevitably happens. I leaked <laughs> it myself many times on Hacker News and other places, just made it available. Um, because in the beginning, some piracy is good. You're looking more for awareness. Uh, that's the harder challenge we have. Um, so my question to them is that why would you really want to, 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 to basically um, have a book like that, who, you know, there's so many copies of it that are just kind of blatantly floating around. Uh, and I'm going to have the PDF version out with the final version very soon as well. And so what they told me is that they're not, you know, they're actually, they're, they're, they're actually very interested in publishing the book because what they see is me demonstrating early traction. So even the, the fact that I was able to, by that time, be able to sell a thousand copies of this book to them was a way of mitigating risk. It was, um, and when, I, when, when they said it that way, it immediately made sense to me because that's very much like a, a latter stage investor would think, a VC would think, is they're not really looking to invest in your early stage startup idea because it's just way too risky. And they're gonna have to look at all these proxies unless you have a stellar team, a dream team, you know, all these things and have a lot of experience in this space and you know, all kinds of different proxies. They're not gonna even touch you with a 10 foot pole because you're just too risky. Um, but once you have early traction, then everything changes. You've actually been able to demonstrate some market potential and they feel with their channels and their resources, they can really like, take this to places where you can on your own. And so that made a lot of sense to me. But even then, the irony there is that you then have to question and see if that is really that right action for you at that right time. <laughs> so I was asking if I was, if I was selling this book on my own, I was getting to pocket all the money. I was, there, was no, there, was, there was no middleman in the way. I had to just give, pay some credit card transaction fees. And the lean startup movement was growing. There was really, um, I was really selling this book at that point on my own and felt I could do it for some time. So the question of whether that's the right thing for me to do, but I, so it took me, so it was not really a ready, it was, it was, it was not really a, an immediate yes. It took me like several weeks to, to really decide and see if going the publisher route was the right option. And eventually I did this, decide that yes, I am gonna go the publishing route. But I have been selling this book um, on my own up until now. So there is a second edition of the book that's being written that will be carried by O'Reilly and it will also be co-branded with Eric Reese's um, book or series of books that he's creating on Lean Startup. And that's what made it interesting for me is that I was, for me personally, the book was really a platform and trying to, to, trying to put it in the right place where it was not just a printed book, but it was actually a book that had more, more impact was something I was interested in. So that made it all interesting, and all that kind of happened over several weeks after that initial call. Um, but on my own, I've been able to, I, 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 once the book was finished, I did go back to that ugly landing page and spend a little bit of time to put some marketing copy. So early adopters are great because they, are, they're not only, they, they, they not only help you iterate on the product, but they also give you great <coughs> testimonials afterwards if, if they like your product. So I was able to get a, a handful of testimonials and something I didn't mention about that two-week release cycle is that working in small batches is actually um, very, very conducive to feedback. So if I had given somebody an, an entire book to read and tell me what they liked or not liked about it, it's a massive thing for them to, to do because they don't even know necessarily where to start. And if they really go very um, rigorous on it and they actually start critiquing uh, uh, every chapter as they went, it would be too much information for me to process as well. So it creates these large batches of work on both sides. But by doing these two-week cycles, I was only giving them two chapters. And as a result of that, I was getting uh, feedback on just two cycles, uh, on two chapters. And it helped me like, really improve just those two chapters. So little things like typos and grammatical errors got nixed. But even like flows, like one chapter flowing to the other, got pointed out. And I was able to go back and rewrite entire chapters to make the book even better. And then I even had some of the readers, and Emiliano is one of them who's sitting back there, who actually saw my graphics and said they weren't really they're actually ugly, they weren't really that good. And so he actually went and redrew them in an illustrator and, and sent them to me and said, you know, these are much better graphics to put in your book. And so some of the, the graphics in the newer book are all done by, by Emiliano. Um, so that's an example of how the early adopters of your audience, when you actually co-build a product with them, they feel like they have some ownership and they're actually as, as invested in the final product as you are and help make that product better. So that's something I forgot to highlight earlier, which was an important point to mention. So I showed you that 
product development cycle of requirements and release. And a lot of us in that middle when we are writing this book or when we're building the product kind of do it in isolation. The trick is trying to, uh, trying to surround yourself with your customers to where you can build that co-creation, co that co-partnership with them. And everyone still has incentives. They are interested because they, they have problems that you are potentially solving. And you're interested because you're really trying to build the best possible solution for them. And that's a great partnership to have um, and what fundamentally I think customer development is really about. And so as of, um, I think, two or three months ago, I, I did hit the 10,000 bookmarks. I've sold 10,000 books um, on my own. It will be out as a second edition starting in January. And so this, this version will kind of go away. But it'll, it'll still be circulating in whatever way it is. But there'll be a, a more revised, um, more up-to-date version uh, that will be out in January. <clears throat> And so the other thing that I also like to talk about is the book, since I wrote it in this iterative fashion like software, it, it never felt like it was really done even when I was done. Because Lean Startup, as Eric and I both like to kind of point out, is it's, it's very much at its infancy. A lot of these ideas have just started to kind of circulate. Even though it's been three years in the making, it feels like it's, it's very, very early in the process. People are very new to it. Even in the room, only half the people knew what Lean Startup was. So even 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 these ideas are going to evolve over time, and so I continue to write. So my blog has become some some a place where I didn't stop writing. I kept writing, and I still do um, every week or every other week. Uh, in addition, I added a newsletter, which are for people who buy the book. It gives them slightly more advanced uh, tactics and techniques that I cover in the newsletter. Um, and then the workshops that were um, were actually for me just an MVP for testing the books. Once the book came out, it actually became a product. Um, people started contacting me, asking me to, to come out to places and, and talk to them, places like accelerators, um, incubators, um, other companies that are interested in applying lean or lean startup techniques are, are all interested in, in having these workshops. And so that has become a little byproduct of what I do as well, is I, I, I do travel around the world and I do give workshops like this in different places. And I try to pick new places every single time. So it's, uh, it's just, again, something that I get out of it, is I love to travel and, and, and meet entrepreneurs everywhere. So that's something that, that makes it interesting as well. But I will say that, so I, I talked about how I had a company over here. And at some point, I sold it. Um, and I'll, I'll finish that story a little bit later on. But I will say that um, I, I'm, I'm not um, someone who wants to be a speaker or a consultant. I, I have too much of a product DNA built, built driven into me. And I get more satisfaction out of building products. And throughout this journey or throughout this process, I was able to immerse myself very deeply in, with other entrepreneurs and talk about these problems that I was facing, but also really work with other entrepreneurs very closely and began to, uh, began to recognize several problems that were very similar uh, in, uh, it, or, uh, or something we had in common. And so, so using that kind of insight, immersing yourself in the problem, um, I was able to identify a few products that I'm now like bringing to market and I'm building. And so that is what I decided to do next, is I sold the company last year. And I've been working on um, this new company called Spark 59, which is going to be a combination of you know, some, some of all of these things. It helps me combine everything, the writing, the workshops. But more interestingly for me is building the products that I've, I've, I'm now building, which many of these actually started as scratch your own itch problems. They were all homegrown systems. all things I was using in isolation for myself. But by seeing it be having a, have a much bigger reach, it kind of gave me permission to say, let's, let's turn these things into real products and, and take a go at it. So that's, that's kind of a complete story of, um, of how all this thing evolved.